Om Vajitana-pavane-pyo-vaishnave-pyo-namo-namaha-namo-om-vishnu-padaya-krishna-prasthaya-bhutale-shrimate-bhakti-vedanta-swami-nityamine-namaste-sarasati-hede-kodavari-
I'm your puppet. You just make me dance. You make me do whatever you want. I will simply fulfill this mission. So Srila Prabhupada continued. He has another heart attack, a second heart attack while on the boat. Now, most people, they would have left their body at this stage. But Srila Prabhupada, he's not leaving. Krishna wants him to do something. He wants to do something. So he arrives in America. Now, why go to America? Well, because he's supposed to preach in English. But why not just spread this movement around in India? It'd be a heck of a lot easier, don't you think? He's Indian. Everybody here is Indian. Speaking the same language, understanding the same culture, would have been quite easy. He tried. But at that time, everyone in India was thinking, I want to be like the Americans. I want money. I want all these opulences that the Americans have. So they weren't even interested in their own culture. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> so Sri Prabhupada he had to go to America to spread this movement. But he also had a plan. He thought, if I can convince the Americans, because everybody's looking up to the Americans, if I can convince the Americans to take to this process, the whole world will take to this process. And Prabhupada was right. But many swamis have come from India and brought to America. And they made a few disciples. They would go to the rich areas and get a couple of old rich widow women to follow them. Srila Prabhupada didn't do this. He goes to a place called the Bowery. Now the Bowery is what we call in America a slum. Everybody heard that word? A slum? It's like the worst place in all of New York City. Prabhupada would go for a walk on the street. Excuse me. He's stepping over drunks, lying on the sidewalk. There's all kinds of abominable ugh, vomit, urine, and bodies lying in it. And Prabhupada has to walk around them just to get to his place. But the determination of Srila Prabhupada is so strong, nothing is going to stop him. Nothing. So he starts this Hare Krishna movement. Now, just saying those words in 1966 in America, Hare Krishna, everybody's like, Hare Krishna? Um, who? Who are we talking about? Hare Krishna. It's not a common thing. Nobody has heard of Krishna. So although we have had other sannyasis, gurus, come, Nobody was spreading this Krishna consciousness. They would have a few select, very rich, very generous people supporting them. There were sannyasi swamis selling mantras. I'll give you your secret mantra for only $250. Wow, sounds like a deal. I get my own mantra for $250. Not a bad deal, right? But Prabhupada says, this Hare Krishna mantra, it's for everybody, not just for sale for you or for you because you have money, but you don't, sorry, you don't get the mantra. You can have it, you have money, you have money, but you don't, you don't get it. No, Prabhupada gave the mantra to everybody. He did not care if you had a penny. He didn't even care if you were on drugs. He didn't even care if you understood anything. Huh, what, turn on Krishna, yeah, sure. That was the kind of people that Srila Prabhupada was attracting. In America, 1966, people were frustrated. The young people of America, they did not want to follow in their father's footsteps. You can take over my business, son. I don't want your business. I'm not into this society thing. I don't want a little house with a little fence around it and two kids playing in the yard. No, nobody wanted that. What they wanted was freedom. Free everything. Free love. Free sex. Free drugs. That's what they wanted. They wanted this freedom. We're tired of being told what to do and how to act. 
So the people that were coming to Srila Prabhupada were what they call hippies. Who knows what a hippie? Remember the word hippie? We don't have that anymore. There's really no hippies. Well, maybe in remote areas, but they're not like out in the streets anymore. You don't see hippies. But hippies are all into this freedom thing. And Prabhupada was saying, okay, you want freedom? I will give you freedom. I will give you freedom from birth. I will give you freedom from death, from old age, from disease. You simply chant this mantra. Nothing to pay, only the desire to become free from birth, death, old age, and disease. So Prabhupada was giving everybody <coughs> this mantra. Now, so many people were taking to this. There were hmm, 10, 15 people that were actually serious, that loved what the Swami, Srila Prabhupada, was saying. Now, Prabhupada, he started this movement. He incorporated it. Now, 10 or 15 followers, none of them that serious, kind of serious, but not that serious. And Prabhupada says, I will now incorporate this movement. I will call it the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Now, all his followers, they're thinking, why are we calling it International Society for Krishna Consciousness? What about the New York group of people that like God? No, that's not going to work. Prabhupada says, International Society for Krishna Consciousness. But Prabhupada, nobody knows who Krishna is, and nobody is outside New York. Why are we calling it international? One time, Srila Prabhupada is sitting on a bench. <laughs> He's sitting down next to another older gentleman. The older gentleman says, oh, so you're a Swami. Prabhupada says, yes. Oh, you have center? He says, I have many centers. I have 108 centers. Prabhupada only had a little storefront at the time. But Prabhupada knew he would have at least 108 centers, which he did when he finally left his body. He had 108 centers. But Prabhupada had this vision that this Krishna consciousness would spread all over the world. And sure enough, it has spread all over the world. I live in Mayapur, which is the birthplace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, very special in this movement of chanting Hare Krishna. Now, in Mayapur, I gave a class one time in the morning, and I was very curious, because I was sitting there, and there was a lot of different looking people in the class. Not everybody looked the same. They all looked very different. So I was asking, I said, please, I want everyone to say where you are from. And prior to the class, 26 different countries were represented in this class. 26 different countries. People were saying, Peru, really? China, Russia, wow. Afghanistan. No, really? <laughs> there were people from all around the world, and it wasn't even that big of a class. I mean, maybe as well, not even as big as this. 26 different countries, all in Sri Mayapur, West Bengal, for a class on Srimad Bhagavatam. How does this happen? How does, speaking of how does this happen? Look at me. I'm from America. I'm talking about Krishna here in Kanpur, India. <laughs> Come on. Tell me that's not amazing. How the heck am I? I should be sitting there going, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? But yet I'm up here telling you about Krishna consciousness. Wow. That's like a miracle. That's amazing. At least I think it's pretty amazing. I just don't know how that happens. That must be some kind of special, special person. Special, special mercy. And that's Srila Prabhupada. He brought this movement to America. Started out with a bunch of ex-hippie devotees, ex-hippie followers, and now this movement is in at least 
26 countries that I know of, but actually it's all around the world. To tell you how all around the world is, I was in this class, and one of the boys there was from a place in America we used to make fun of. We used to say, if you're really bad, they'll send you to Siberia, because it's like the middle of the end of the earth, freezing cold. Who wants to live in Siberia? <laughs> I met a kid from Siberia in this class. I said, really? We have a temple, a Harvard Christian in Siberia? He goes, oh yes, <laughs> oh yes. He was showing me pictures. The Hare Krishna is in Siberia. They go out. The snow is like this high. Their heads are just barely above it. Hare Krishna! <laughs> but that's how amazing this mantra, this movement is. So Srila Prabhupada, he starts this little movement. And at that time, it was a little movement. There wasn't a whole lot of followers. But it slowly gained traction. And people in Canada, other parts of America, Australia, Europe, all started to become attracted to what Srila Prabhupada was saying. Krishna is God. Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead. And guess what? You're not your body. I'm you're telling me I'm not my body? Come on. <laughs> what do you mean I'm not my body? <laughs> Looking pretty good. Feeling pretty good. Not my body. <laughs> Maybe you're not your body. <laughs> not my body. <laughs> so Prabhupada's main message was that. The reason you're not happy because you're in the material world, in a material body, and you are a spirit soul that's in the body, in the material world. Now, Prabhupada gives us the way out of this dilemma that we're stuck in. We're stuck here. We can't get out. I'm stuck in this body. You're stuck in your body. We're all stuck in the material world. It's a temporary place. That's kind of scary, isn't it? Don't you get a little bit, you know, temporary, like, you're going to die. Oh, die? Really? I don't want to die. Nobody wants to die. And it's an unnatural feeling, isn't it? You're going to die. Don't be so morbid. Don't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Sorry. You're going to get old. I don't want to get old. You're going to die. I don't want to die. Well, guess what? You don't have to. Really? Did he just say that? He did. He just said that. You don't have to die. How do you not die? Well, you understand. You're not this body. Who understands that? Raise your hand. You're not this body. Do you get it? No. Nobody gets it. My work is going to be harder than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the first thing you have to understand, and this is the most important thing about the Hare Krishna movement, is that message. You are not this body. You are a spirit soul. Yeah. Like for me, I'll tell you, I'm in an old body. It's not young and wonderful like it used to be. <laughs> but I still feel like that. And every once in a while, I, I still like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm moving around. And all of a sudden, it's like, ah, don't hurt. Oh, no, that hurt. But I still feel like I'm a young guy. I still feel like a little kid. Hey, let's go for a run. <sighs> okay, well, that's enough. <laughs> But I still have that desire because I have not changed. The body has changed, but I haven't. I'm still that same fired up young fellow that I've always been. But I'm in an old body. So it's kind of depressing to see that, you know what? This is not going to work for you. You're never going to be happy. You're just going to get old. You're going to die. And guess what? You're going to do it again. Really? 
I gotta do this all whole thing again? Well, you know what? You don't even know at the time of death what body you'll get next. Who knows? Do you remember any of your last bodies? Raise your hand. No. Nobody knows. You don't know where you've been. You don't know where you're going. But wouldn't you like to know where you're going? Well, that's what the Hare Krishna movement is all about. We're trying to tell you, you're not your body. And if you can remember you're not your body and act accordingly, which is what Bhagavad Gita tells us, how to act accordingly as a spirit soul, guess what? You get to go back to Godhead at the end of this body. No more birth, death, old age, disease. Finished. Sounds pretty good. Now, because this movement was introduced in America in 1966, people were freaked out by Hare Krishnas. It was so foreign, so different. I mean, look at me. Look what I'm wearing. I got a little piece of hair in the back. I got a shaved head. Now, in Vrindavan, India, where the sadhus are, yeah, I mean, I fit right in. In Kanpur, up on a stage in the IIT, look at this guy. <laughs> He's from the West and he's dressed like this. Woo! Kind of different. Could you imagine 1966? They've never seen Hare Krishnas. They have no clue what it's about. They just think, these guys are super weird. Get them out of here. We don't want you in our cities and towns. Get out of here. Now what happens if a young person joins the Hare Krishnas? His parents are like, what happened, boy? You've been brainwashed. What did they do to you? Did they kidnap you? Well, guess what? Some parents took us to court. They took the Hare Krishna movement to court saying, we brainwashed. We kidnapped. You're not a religion. You're some crazy cult. Well, Prabhupada, he said, this is how we will prove our case. Bring all of our books and we have a lot of books. Bring all of our books into court. Tell the judge he must read all of his <laughs> books. <laughs> and he will understand that we are bona fide. That the Bhagavad Gita has been around longer than the Bible. Longer than the Quran. It's the oldest book in existence. But tell him to read all our books. Now, we were expecting a very long litigation, super long, like maybe 14 weeks, months, who knows, long time, because we were fighting the system. The system didn't want Hare Krishnas in America. The system wanted to label us as freaks, as weird, go back to India, take it back, we don't want it. Well, we brought all of our books into the courtyard, the courtroom. Like, different languages, you name it, we started piling them on the table. And the judge is thinking, what are you doing? Oh, we're bringing you all our proof. This is our proof. You must read it, right? <laughs> this is our evidence that we are bona fide. We don't brainwash. We don't kidnap. We just invite people to come join us. If you want, you join us. People used to say to us, they'd see us out chanting on the streets. And they'd say, why don't you go get a job? Prabhupada says, tell them, why don't you join us? It's a simple solution, huh? You got a problem? Come on, join us. So Prabhupada had us bring all the books into the courtyard. He said it again. What's with that? Into the courtroom. And the judge looked at all the books. And he said, I'm not reading all that. <laughs> this is what you are, is your evidence? And he said, yes, this is our evidence. He says, well, obviously you are bona fide. You have books that back up your philosophy. This is a real religion. Case dismissed. 
1977 that was. Hare Krishna, bona fide religion. Totally allowed to do everything every other religion was allowed to do. We could go to the airports. We could distribute our books. We could chant on the streets. They couldn't stop us. Freedom of religion. So the movement spread. Everyone was getting to know what Krishna consciousness is about. Now, the year 2020, if you say the word Hare Krishna, pretty much anywhere in the world, you say Hare Krishna, everybody knows what you're talking about. Everybody, even in small towns all around the world, they know Hare Krishna. They know yoga. Yoga is not some freaky activity. Everybody understands yoga. Vegetarian. They all get it now. The world is turning vegetarian. How did this come about? Simply by the... Say it. Hare Krishna. Do it together. Hare Krishna. There you go. The Hare Krishna movement is bringing about this change in the world. People are becoming more sensitive to their world, to their environment, to animals, to each other. They're starting to understand maybe there is something in this Hare Krishna movement. Now, originally, when people became attracted to this Krishna consciousness. They moved in the temple. It was pretty much the way you did it. Because it was very difficult, because we didn't know what to do, how to act. So by moving in the temple, you learned. You learned how to do everything you needed to do. Now, you don't have to. Of course you can if you want to, but we're not telling you you have to do this. We don't have to move in the temple to be Krishna conscious. It's so easy to do. You can do it at home. There are people who you would not even know are practicing Krishna consciousness. If he didn't shave his head and leave that little hair in the back, would you know that this professor right here <laughs> He's a Hare Krishna. You wouldn't know that. You go to a doctor and he's up, you walk in and he goes, Oh, Hare Krishna. What? Oh, oh, oh. He's a Hare Krishna? Yes! He's a Hare Krishna too. The lawyer is a Hare Krishna. Now in America, there's somebody running for president who's a Hare Krishna. Wow. Is that off the charts? Running for president of the United States of America. And she's a Hare Krishna. She was born a Hare Krishna. Her name is Tulsi. Everyone heard of Tulsi Gabbard? She's running for president. She's a Hare Krishna. So this Krishna consciousness has come into the whole world. It's infiltrated in. And that was Prabhupada's plan. He was saying that these books, I don't know why I wish I had a book here. These books are like bombs. And we are dropping them everywhere. We are dropping these bombs everywhere. These books have been translated into almost every single language in the world. There is no excuse for anybody not to have availability to these special books of the Hare Krishna movement. In 1970, Srila Prabhupada went to India with his disciples from America. Now, they put up a big sign in Bombay. Very special Pondell program featuring A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada of the Hare Krishna movement 
and his Western sadhus. Western sadhus. And everyone is going, what is a Western sadhu? Who knows what a Western sadhu looks like? Sadhus are not from the West. Sense gratification is from, great cars are from the West. Lots of money is from the West. But a sadhu from the West? And Prabhupada advertised this as that. And one time, Srila Prabhupada was in a, a, a casual, in his room gathering. And a reporter was there. And this reporter said to him, there are so many swamis. And they are performing so many miracles, producing bits of gold in their hand, dust coming out of their hair. So many miracles. What miracle can you perform? And Prabhupada looked around the room and raised his hands towards all his disciples and said, these are my miracles. Because he has turned people like myself and so many others into Western sadhus. Now, I never grasped the fact that I was actually a Western sadhu. But you know what? I kind of like that. I'm going to call myself that from now on. <laughs> Joseph Patrick Gallagher, which is my name. It's the first time I've seen that name actually posted. Joseph Patrick Gallagher. The Western Saga. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll get some cards printed up. What do you think? Western Saga. <laughs> now I know that this, this means a lot. You know, after this talk, you know, I'm West with the urn on there and Sadhu. Western Sadhu. That's me. Now, Srila Prabhupada, he also had another name for his Western devotees. He called us Dancing White Elephants. <laughs> I can relate to that. I can relate to the dancing white elephant more than I can the Western Sadhu. I can be both. Western Sadhu, dancing white elephant. But Srila Prabhupada, he pushed on this movement, not just in America, not just in Asia, Australia, New Zealand. The movement now is everywhere. And everywhere means everywhere. China, Russia, there are people flocking to the Hare Krishna movement all around the world, especially those countries, China and Russia. They've been oppressed for so long, now they're allowed to become who they want to be. They can be a Hare Krishna if they want. We are making so many people Krishna conscious all around the world. And this is all because of Srila Prabhupada's journey to America in 1965. It started the whole thing off. And we are very proud to go everywhere and tell everybody about Krishna. Now, one of the big concerns, and maybe we're all students here, mainly, we we'll say that, we're all kind of students. One of the big concerns for a student is his parents. We're still under the control of our parents a bit, right? So if you say that I'm becoming attracted to this Hare Krishna movement, they're like, whoa, you're going to school, buddy. I'm putting you through this university. You're paying me back later. Don't you worry about it. They're worried you're going to like, well, you know, be like me. Put on the dough you cook the thing, shave your head, move into a temple, and say bye bye. See you later. I'm Alasadu. They're worried about that, and they should be. But we're not telling you to do that. We're not telling you to do that at all. We're saying continue with your education. Please continue with your education. Get your degrees. Please get your degrees. Make yourself successful. Please make yourself successful. But be Christian conscious. And that's not a big ask, is it? Can everybody do that if they wanted to? You could be Christian conscious, still be a chemist, still be a scientist. I have an example right here. He's a, he's a, a what is that you do? Robotic something or I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> 
And he's a Hare Krishna, a full on Hare Krishna. See the little thing in the back? <laughs> he's a real, real Hare Krishna. And he's been here for 18 years in this university as a Hare Krishna. So we're not telling anybody to, well, this is the motto back in the 60s in America, tune in, tune out, and drop out. We don't want you to drop out of school. That's the last thing we want you to do. Trust me. If you come to Prabhu here, to this wonderful gentleman, and you say, I want to stop going to school and go move into temple, he's going to say, don't do it. Aren't you? <laughs> exactly. He's not going to encourage that. That's the last thing we want. We want you to stay in school. We want you to get your degrees. But here's the thing. In your life, let's just say, because there's a lot of mathematicians here, let's just say, you are a bunch of zeros. How do you make that number a number? The zero doesn't mean anything. How do you make it important? You put a one in front of it. The one then turns that bunch of zeros into a pretty big number. Well, that one is Krishna. You put Krishna in front. You put Krishna in the center. And those zeros turn into a great big long number. So that's what we want you to do. <laughs> Don't give up on college. Don't give up on university. Stay in, study, and follow that path that you're already on. But put Krishna in your life. Okay? Now I'm going to stop right now and hopefully we can have some discussion while I'm here in beautiful Kanpur. This is my first time in Kanpur, and if I get my desire and wish, I will come back again. Because it's been so wonderful meeting so many wonderful, wonderful young men and women. And there are certainly a lot here in Kanpur, especially all of you students. Um, one time in a lecture, Srila Prabhupada, and I always refer to him because he is my spiritual master. He is my guru. He gave a talk, and he asked the questions. And the audience all just had this blank look on their face. And Srila Prabhupada turned to the devotee sitting next to him, and he said, no questions means no intelligence. Mm. So do we have any questions? <laughs> Anybody? There wasn't one thing I said that you want to say, wait a minute, or there was not one thing I said you would say, hold on, I have a question about that. All right, I'm out of here. <laughs> really? Is that easy? We can go? We don't have any questions about the Hare Krishna movement. <sighs> what time is it? Oh, it's 7 o'clock. Then we can continue. Uh, do you have any questions? They're all surrendered souls. <laughs> Pretty easy. Uh, probably you can uh, talk about the more about the movement. About the movement. I got off track. Of the so the movement is, is flourishing all around the world. The movement is changing the consciousness of the world. As we stop the slaughtering of animals, People are becoming more conscious of being vegans, vegetarians. People are being more conscious of the different bad things that happen when you're not Krishna conscious. The wars, the famines, the natural disasters, these are all happening because we're failing to understand the source of this whole world, the source of us, and that's Krishna. If we could tune back into that, all these things would be stopping dramatically. I don't have a whole lot more. I'm sorry. All right. Hold on. We have a question. Uh, Go for why it. is it so important for students to be in Krishna conscious? Well, I think I kind of already said that. In the fact that your desires are to become somebody in the material world. 
correct? I mean, you want to be, what, what is your goal? What would you want to be? Why are you attending this university? Let me ask you. Why are you attending this university? I, I want to get my PhD in, in? in computer science. In, in computer science. Computer science. So you have a desire to earn your livelihood with computer science, correct? Yeah. So now you are going to one of the best universities in India to obtain <laughs> that degree so that you will be successful. So why should you want to be Krishna conscious? Because if you get that degree, if you get that great job, what's the goal? What's the finish line for that? You're going to get old, you're going to work really hard, and then what? <laughs> By becoming Krishna conscious, you can still do all those things, but there's a goal at the end. And the goal is to go back to God. It's not to stay in this material world in the nicest house, drive the nicest car, and have the most money. And when you go, you leave this body, what happens to all that? You don't take it with you, correct? What, what will you take with you is your consciousness. So Krishna says, think of me at the time of death, and you will come back to me. So that's why it's very important to be Krishna conscious. And you can be anything in this material world. You can have any occupation as long as it's not some demoniac thing. But computer science is not demoniac. Chemistry is not demoniac unless you're trying to create life in a test tube or something like that. But other than that, you can be all of these different professions. But you're now offering the results to Krishna. You're seeing that the results are coming from Krishna. It's not you. But you certainly have capabilities. Krishna has given you these capabilities. If you see it like that, then you will be completely successful. Whatever it is we are able to do, it's a blessing from Krishna. See it like that. And you can do whatever you need to do in this material world. So, I, I, I have heard from the uh, senior devotees that when you uh, become Krishna conscious, then this natural world uh, seems very dry. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it uh, that important to mention the balance between the material world, our uh, responsibilities, and Hare Krishna, because Krishna consciousness, and uh, if it is important to uh, make that balance, knowing that Krishna consciousness is the ultimate thing. Is it necessary to maintain a balance? Or yes. It's the same idea as that I'm saying you're not this body. But you have to maintain this body, don't you? So you have to sleep. You have to eat. These are important parts of maintaining that body. So to live in this material world, you need money. You need some sort of occupation that pays you some money. So yes, you have to balance. And one of the beautiful things is that you don't need to give up your material life to be spiritual. You turn that into your life spiritual by making yourself Krishna conscious. It's like Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita. He's a warrior, a fighter. He kills people. And Krishna says, don't give that up. That's who you are. That's what you've been trained to do. But now I'm telling you to do it, so now you do it for me. So now you would do this, whatever occupation you're about to get into, you do it with the perspective of, I would do this in Krishna service. If I make a ton of money, let me give some to Krishna. And then it becomes a spiritual activity. How it was for you practicing your life, especially from when you are a great of life and being, you are not getting money in the morning, but all the time. You are the one that you are practicing spiritual life. How is it possible to practice spiritual life if you are unable to attend the program that Prabhu has in the morning? Right? Right. So he's saying you are born in America. Yes. And you are able to practice for the last 45 oh, years. Oh, I see. How I'm born in India. Yeah. And I'm not able to get out of the morning. <laughs> so your problem is basically just getting up in the morning? I got a suggestion. <laughs> They sell them. They're called alarm clocks. <laughs> if you really want to get up, you set the alarm clock. It's worked for me. 45 years, I set the alarm clock. 
Some of these answers to questions are so simple, we just tend to not be able to go there because basically you don't want to get up. If you don't want to get up, you don't get up. If you want to get up, you get up. It's really that simple. If it's important to you, you'll do it. Right? So it's your priorities. What is your priority? If your priority is to attend the program, then you can go. If it's not a priority, then you work around that and you don't go. Pretty simple. I do not want to get Ah, ah. Oh, microphone. Why do we call it a movement? Say it again. Why do we call it a movement? The movement. movement. <laughs> because it's moving. It's <laughs> not. <laughs> you need the alarm clock too. <laughs> because this is a fluid situation. It's fluid. It's always moving. It's always spreading. This Krishna consciousness is spreading. It's spreading within you. It's spreading within everybody here. It's spreading all around the world. It's a movement. That's why it's called the movement, the Hare Krishna movement. Yeah. 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 Yes. And it is even more older than Bible. Yes. Now, this is something that is easy to believe because it is our own culture. Yes. But how difficult it is for you to believe, like the people in USA, if someone comes and tells you that there is a book that is even older in spiritual context. It can be proved. And that's the difference. It can be proved. And <laughs> it's just, again, you have to be open minded or you're just going to knock back everything. The spiritual, the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, I don't want anything to do with any of this. But when you start to understand that there is a God, there is somebody in control, and then naturally you want to find out who he is. And, and, and what is he telling me? And that's what Bhagavad Gita is about. He's telling you something. But if you read Bhagavad Gita, and this is how it worked for me, I read the Bhagavad Gita, and I was going, wow, does that make sense? Oh, does that make sense? Everything just made total sense. And no offense to all the Christians if there's any here, but I read the Bible and I didn't quite understand what was going on. It didn't answer any questions. I told this the other day at your house. I was in a Catholic school and I guess they called me a smart aleck. Do you remember that word smart aleck? A wise guy? Because I used to ask the, 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 the nun, the sister, who is God? And she would say, it's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery? What do you mean? You don't know, in other words, who is God? Have faith, young man. Like, what? Tell me who he is. I want to know. Well, Bhagavad Gita can tell you who he is. Bhagavad Gita can show you who he is. You can get to know his name where he lives, everything about him. And he gives you a guidebook. This is the guidebook, the Bhagavad Gita. Something like that book. It's the, it's the guidebook of how to get back to God. What more do you want, right? Now, if you think the Bible is easier to follow, follow the Bible. That's okay. But I'm telling you that just like in this university, you have a set of books that in first grade, the primary school, they would not understand. Similarly, the Bhagavad Gita is a little more in depth, a little clearer. It's not your basic don't kill, thou shalt not kill, and they still don't get it. You're not supposed to kill. So that's why Bhagavad Gita is kind of special. Huh. Okay, the question is, have you ever felt that you missed an average American life? If not, explain why. Raise your hand. Who's the question from? Okay, what is an average American life? <laughs> Obviously, you have something in mind, but you want to put that down. <laughs> Tell me what I missed. 
Maybe I should go back and get it. What is an average American life? Come on, it's your question. What? Rich lifestyle. Well, oh, okay. Well, I guess what? I had it. I did have it. Because as I was a Hare Krishna, I got married. I had children. And I had to go earn a profession to learn, make money. So I had houses. I had cars. I had it all. And that's why I'm retired down in my floor. <laughs> It's the kind of job that after it's done, I go home and I drink alcohol to settle me down. I didn't have that. I'm sorry. I used to hang around people to make my, my business work. I had to hang around people that as soon as it was work is over, they would have what is called a martini. You know what a martini is? It's gin and vermouth, two heavy duty alcohols. And they put it in a pretty glass. And they put a green olive in it with a toothpick. <laughs> and you drink it. And it immediately goes straight to your head. You get intoxicated on the first sip. Because it's straight alcohol. There's no soda mixed with it. It's straight stuff. And this is what almost every average American <laughs> has at the end of the day. Unless he's a lower class one, and then he goes to the bar and knocks back a few beers. And you're hoping, and, and I, I'm supposed to miss that? I don't miss that. And why don't I miss that? Because at the end of my day, I do kirtan. I chant Hare Krishna. I jump up and down like a, well, you know, like a young guy. Still doing it, 45 years later. I'm still tasting. This ecstasy. I have never had a Hare Krishna hangover. <laughs> That's a joke. I've never had that. New Year's Eve in Mayapur. We have kirtan till midnight at night. Then we have a big feast. That's how the Hare Krishna party. That's how we party. Meanwhile, outside, people go to the bars and they get drunk and they're thinking, I'm going to have a great time, and they don't have it. It turns into like the worst night of your life. So, average American life. Eh, not happening. Okay. Next question. How does the book publishing begin? I heard initially ISKCON is deprived of many of which organization published books first. <coughs> Is, is kind of deprived of money. I'm sorry, of money. Which organization published books first? <coughs> is that like, am I supposed to say the BBT? Mm. Our, we, we have our own uh, printing. It's the Bhakti Book Trust. And they print all the books. And all the books are printed in, I don't know how many languages now, 92 languages or something. Something. Yeah, I, I was just uh, getting uh, an uh, account that our BBT has published more than 64 crores, that means 640 million books. In 1977, we were up to 44 million. Uh, so now it's up to 640 million, million books. books. So there's a few of Prabhupada's books out there, which is really nice. We're very happy about that. Okay. Next. <laughs> This is me. All right. There are different <coughs> processes of meditation, but how it differs, but how it is different? Meditating on Krishna, well, how is it different? Meditating on Krishna and meditating being Krishna conscious. Okay. I, I mentioned this the other day that a young hippie girl in uh, New York City in 1966. Ask Srila Prabhupada, are there many processes to go back to God? And Prabhupada said, no. Just like when you eat food, you must put it in your mouth. You cannot put it in your ear. You cannot put it under your arm. You have to put it in your mouth. So there is one process to go back to God. And that is by remembering God. Now, even in the Christians, and probably, I don't know the Muslim, but they say, hallowed be the name of God. That's in the Christian religion. 
And in ours, in the Krishna consciousness, we say, chant Hare Krishna. Krishna is a name for God. He's all attractive. Krishna has millions of names, but that is the one name that we use to chant, the Hare Krishna mantra. Okay? How, how do you different, differentiate between a conscious one and a Krishna conscious one? <laughs> conscious means Krishna conscious. It means Krishna. If you're not Krishna conscious, how are you conscious? What are you conscious of? You don't understand you're not your body. You don't understand there's a supreme God. You don't understand any of that. So conscious means Krishna conscious. <laughs> Can I make take it away? Yeah. Say, uh, just to add to that, you know, what Prabhupada says, right? Consciousness and Krishna consciousness are not different. You see that uh, there's a very uh, philosophical <laughs> statement always made in India. When you see the Srishti, you must be able to see the Srishta. Are you able to follow that? Srishti means creation. And then Srishta is creator. And in fact, Nakartis, long back he told, if you see a chair and you are not able to see the God, that means you are not seeing the uh, chair. Right? And this is exactly, if you are conscious, you should be able to see the creator. And creator is Krishna. So, Krishna consciousness and consciousness are actually not different. <laughs> How do you know that we have achieved the Krishna consciousness like it's possible? We think we had achieved it and died, but we again took a birth. How do you know that? Is there a way we can ensure its achievement? Trust me, when you are 100% Krishna conscious, you will know it. There's no doubt you will know it. If you're thinking, am I or aren't I, obviously you're not. Because once you are 100% Krishna conscious, you are able to see Krishna. You are able to see Krishna. Right now we can't see Krishna because we don't have the purified eyes to see Krishna. So when you're actually purified enough, you will know. You will know. There's no question. And the process is quite fun. It actually is an enjoyable process. As you become Krishna conscious, you can feel this. I can say after 45 years, I am more Krishna conscious than I was in 1975. You should hope so, right? 45 years later. But I can feel it. I actually know that I'm more Krishna conscious. I know my material desires wane. I know this because I trying to be a devotee for 45 years. I'm making this endeavor. I'm trying my hardest so that I get to go back to God in this lifetime. Okay. When we are told to do something by our authority and spiritual master, but that sometimes seems not to be possible or difficult when we think of it. And there may be a chance to disobey him. Sometimes I become completely fearful how to overcome this situation. <laughs> I'm gonna let Boo here answer that question. <laughs> we didn't mention any names here, which is really good. He didn't sign it. Who just ran out the door? <laughs> Yeah. You answered this one. This is a good question for you. Well, actually, uh, if you are told something to do, the, the, the authority or the teacher knows your ability. And uh, in his instruction, and particularly when Prabhupada <coughs> gave instruction to this first, uh, disciples, they could do things that was impossible. Like the, the first, uh, the, the, the back to God and Max and the great finally came out. People didn't know what is journal, how to print it, how to write articles, and, and they could have been able to do it. So, actually, Krishna gives us intelligence ultimately. 
is the super soul situated within our heart. And he guides us. But that process is mediated through the ascent spiritual master. And uh, that is how we need to see. There is no need to become fearful. And uh, in fact, if you think that there are some questions to be asked, you should be very uh, bold to take more suggestions because you are doing things for Krishna. <coughs> and in fact, we really don't say that you do this. Uh, as far as I am concerned, uh, Prabhupada told me to give that answer. I am concerned. I always say what Prabhupada wanted us to do. Uh, because uh, I don't think that I have a dream that Krishna has put in my brain. No. Uh, we see everything through Prabhupada's books, Prabhupada's vision. And whatever Prabhupada <coughs> wanted, uh, we want to fulfill those ideas. And that is how we try to tell each other that this is what we should do. I don't think that there should be any fear if we are not able to do something. No. And actually, somebody asked me this question since I've been here, this exact question. I just can't remember who it was. <laughs> but I answered it pretty much exactly like that. that Sometimes you are asked to do something, and you may think to yourself, I can't do this. And I've told this story that most of you might have heard. That you will then pray, please empower me to do this. And also, the uh, person asking you is not going to ask you to do something he doesn't think you can do. Right? And, and with that instruction comes the empowerment that you surrender to. It. So... Yeah, I mean, when we have authorities, they're there for a reason. They're there to guide us. And the guidance is through their knowledge of who you are and what you are capable of doing. So probably you're not going to be asked something to do that you absolutely can't do. It's probably not going to happen. And the fear thing is just... Come on, really? You're afraid of this guy? <laughs> okay. Uh, this is such a basic one. Okay, I like this. Stuff. Thank you for writing. How to make Christmas center of my life? All right, I have to ask. Who, who wrote that? One? How to make Christmas center? Do you want Krishna to be the center of your life? You really do. Okay, so that sincerity is step one. Step one. Then you have to look at your life. How can you bring Krishna into the center of your life? It's doable for everybody. But it doesn't mean, just like with Bhagavad Gita and Arjuna and Krishna's discussion, Arjuna needed to do what he does, but be Krishna conscious about it. So, like, if you are a student, you need to study. You don't just sit there and, oh, I'm just going to chant Hare Krishna all day long, flunk out of school. No! You have to be conscious of Krishna, that I am doing this to get an occupation so that I can be comfortable in the material world while loving and serving Krishna. So, it's just a, a mindset and a sincerity of your heart. If it's in your heart to become Krishna conscious, then Krishna will make the arrangements for that to happen for you. Good question. How did you meet S S Swami Prabhupada? What is your experience with him? Any special story? Whoever asked me that was not in the Bhagavatam class this morning. <laughs> <laughs> Who asked me that? Who, who wrote this one? <laughs> oh, okay. You should have come to the boarding. I told the whole story, but I'll tell it briefly for you. Briefly. I met Srila Prabhupada in 1976 in New York City. I got initiated in New York City uh, at that particular time by Srila Prabhupada. I told a couple of stories, which I won't tell again. <laughs> It was a very, very uh, monumental time for me to actually meet Shiva Prabhupada. Because pure devotees are not walking around all over the place. And when you actually meet someone like Shiva Prabhupada, who was a pure devotee of God, you can see, you can feel, you can experience. He is from the spiritual world. We are not 
directly casting off that vibration because we are so covered over. We are not 100% Krishna conscious. Srila Prabhupada was. And you can sense that simply by looking. We have this glow of happening. And devotees used to say that. It looked like he was glowing. It looked like he wasn't touching the ground when he walked. There were so many amazing things about Srila Prabhupada. People used to have a problem. And like they wanted to complain about their temple president. And they would walk into Prabhupada and say, I really have, to, can I ask you a question? Prabhupada would say, Yes, this, whatever his name is, is doing such a fine job. We need to be able to respect and honor his decisions. Now, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> and the boy would go, um, No, no, nothing for Prabhupada. Thank you. The Prabhupada would do that so many times. And people used to ask for the Prabhupada, do you know everything? And Prabhupada would say, only what Krishna wants me to know. So a pure devotee is somebody very unique, very special, and I'm happy somehow or other I got blessed to meet Srila Prabhupada to take initiation from him. But everything Prabhupada teaches, everything Prabhupada is, is passing on in his books, which are the law books for the next 10,000 years, are all in those books. Prabhupada is in those books. So you can have just as much association with Srila Prabhupada as I can. Because I can go out, I can read the book, you can read the book, so we can all have that association. And basically, all of your questions are answered in Prabhupada's books. <coughs> So, uh, sir, it's you. No, as, as you have told, you are here not because of Krishna, but because of Srila Prabhupada that you follow him. Well, sort of. Then why can't I follow Lord Shiva? Ooh, okay. Like he was a devotee of Krishna, and his devotees are something happy. I'm going to eat. Oh, Gauris, sorry, happy, yeah. Have the freedom to eat flesh, have a list of sex any time. It can be high on the weed almost every time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who, who wrote this one? <laughs> really? Do you really believe this? You're okay with that? Then you're good. I have nothing to say. I'm not going to get into a discussion. <laughs> Seriously. It's, it's your desire to do these things? Then yes. Shiva, you should worship. But Shiva is a devotee, the greatest devotee of Krishna. But Shiva's job is to help bring people closer to Krishna. And the people that he is bringing closer to Krishna, they eat flesh, have illicit sex any time, and can be high on weed almost every time. So that's the people that Shiva is helping along. But it's still going to take you a while to go back to Krishna by following this process. But that being said is, better worship Shiva, at least you're worshiping somebody. But I don't That's my first time I've ever been asked a Shiva question. <laughs> I'll be honest. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. See, uh, just, to, uh, just to add what Prabhupada said in that, Lord Shiva is the best among the Vaishnavas. He is a perfect servant. Even Mother Parvati cannot agitate her him sexually. He's so fixed. More than that, Lord Shiva is father of this material universe. Although he owns the entire universe, as a father, he doesn't accept even a palace to live. Every day, under a bay tree, Prabhupada says, he speaks on Bhagavatam. And the greatest of Paramahansas, they come and hear Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is about Krishna. That's Lord Shiva. If anybody knows Lord Shiva, then they will do what Lord Shiva is doing. And to say that this is a sex, flesh eating, <laughs> even human. This is animalistic. Okay. But then Lord Shiva is very magnanimous 
to accept even the devotion of such people and purifies that slowly. So that's the point. For those who know Lord Shiva, Shiva Tattva, Shiva Tattva means it's a completely purified state. Shiva. Shiva means absolute purity. So in purity, there cannot be illicit sex, flesh seeking. No. Is that clear? <coughs> So, question. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Who is correct among this man, Karma? Whose question? <laughs> <laughs> ah, and what is your idea? Eh? Achha, Vibhisa. Who is correct among Vibhisa and Karna? But why you are putting that in the same? Vibhisa is apparently like a soldier. Those people are Okay, okay, okay. Then, all right. See, Vivisa is talking about who is right, whether it is Vivisa or Karma. Okay. So, you see, Vivisa, he had opulent, uh, you know, golden king of Sri Lanka. Right? Do you know that? It was uh, in Sri Lanka, that time was made out of gold. Every house, Everything was made of gold. Sona Lanka. That's how it was opulent. And uh, uh, he left those opulence and came to surrender to Lord Ram. So anybody who surrenders to Lord Ram is right always. Okay? Because the ultimate goal is Krishna. Whereas Karna was given opportunity to surrender to Krishna. He did. He cited a real wicked <coughs> person. Huh? So what happened ultimately? Vivisan became immortal. Now you go to Jagannath Temple, you will find that there is a place by which Vivisan every day comes and takes that son of Jagannath in Kudu. Okay? Whereas Karna was annihilated because he cited a wicked person. So it's not a rocket science to understand. Anybody who Krishna said in Bhagavad Gita, Sarva Dharma Paritesya, Maam Ekam There is no other Dharma. The only Dharma is that you must side with what Krishna wants. Did you attend Bhagavad Gita course? You attend. What did you say there? Thank you, Dhamma. We said, no, Krishna has a free will, right? And what is that free will? It prevails. That is the meaning of God. God wants something that will happen anyway. He wants no one. But the definition of God is truly prevails. Whatever He wants, that's true. Definition of God has to be understood properly. Right? When we say Krishna or Shiva, as a Krishna or Rama, we should not look at them as a human. They are not human. They are always absolute. Okay? So, Vibhishana surrendering to Krishna or Rama or Arjuna surrendering to Krishna, they are surrendering to absolute. Okay? So I need another question. Okay. Would you like to? Okay. 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 Does Krishna consciousness make you free of materialistic relations like that of mother, sons, and father? Does it make you forget all you loved ones who have lost? It makes me worry because of these reasons. Well, that's kind of an easy one, too. That these relations are something that are not 
permanent. Who has a U.S. These relationships of, of wife, mother, child are not permanent. We get that. We understand that. We have certain relations in this life that we will not have in the next life. But being a Hare Krishna doesn't mean you abandon everybody and everything and all your contacts and everyone that you know simply because you become a devotee. Now, obviously, you're not going to have intimate contact with somebody that is telling you you're crazy for following this Christian consciousness. You should be eating meat. You should be having illicit. You should be not going to want to talk so much like that to them. But you're always going to have respect for parents. You're always going to love parents. You're always going to love your children. But your association changes. Just like in this room right now, is anybody here with their parents? Yes? Okay, so you have your parents here. That's kind of rare that you show up with your parents. Your parents are not in school with you. But yet you still have relation with them. Just because you're in school doesn't mean you're forgetting about them. Is that correct? Right? So it's the same idea. You're not going to immediately say, I'm not, I don't have parents anymore. I'm in school. I'm a Hare Krishna. I don't have parents anymore. It doesn't work like that. So it's not like a drastic change. You know? Just like you go to school, you leave home, you're in school, you're by yourself. You don't forget your parents. You don't say, that's it, I'm in school, see you later. <laughs> so it's the same idea. It's not like this. I, I just uh, yeah, give a it. couple of examples. In my case, when I accepted uh, uh, the principles of Bhagavad Gita, my parents in the beginning were not very favorable. But then, slowly they understood what I'm doing is right. They also understood that I care for them because I brought them and settled them in Vrindavan. My father and mother are living in Vrindavan for the last 20 years. And they are given all kind of support. Probably they would not have got that, got that support if I would not have become Hare Krishna. In fact, our relationship becomes much more intimate and personal when you become a devotee. Because becoming a devotee makes you a better individual. So where is the question that you will neglect your family members of this attack? You become better wealthy, sir, better carer, better servant. In fact, you become much more sympathetic, uh, sorry, sensitive as well as empathetic to, to their point of view. Okay. In fact, when you are not a devotee, you will mostly act in the selfless part that more. Only you will leave the way you will be my father. I tell another of my friends, uh, he is a professor in IIT of PhD. We all, both of us, we became devoted to this. And he was telling that when his mother in law died, expired. And this happened in, uh, um, in Banaras. And uh, they went to Manika Nikakat to Trinidad. And all the family members that have come, and all of them, they are simply talking, oh, I have to catch a flight to America, oh, I have a, you know, nobody is actually mourning for their mother. Even the sons and daughters, they are not really mourning. They are simply thinking how they can go back to their work. And they just want to finish their cremation. And he was graphically narrating the whole episode, and he was laughing, you see. And then as he was telling that his own wife and everybody else, because he was married before he became Krishna conscious, and they were always critical about him. And then he was showing the real face of his people. They say we are really devoted to our family members, but this is what I'm saying. Okay. I also have um, children that are not Krishna conscious. They decided to stop pursuing the Krishna conscious life. They're still my children. I still talk to them. Obviously, we don't talk about Krishna, but we still have a relationship. So it doesn't stop simply because you become a part of Krishna. I have to read this one. This is so nice. Did you write this? You did? Oh, right. 
This is Hari Krishna Prabhu. You are very funny. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, I love this. What is your favorite food? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough question. <laughs> My favorite food is usually what's in front of me. Does that make sense? Whatever you give me, I'll love it. One thing about prashadam, and does everybody know that word prashadam? Right? It means food. So, that's just a moment. Please be here. Prashadam will reach in 10 minutes. Oh. So you'll be given for prashadam. Okay. In 10 minutes, so we can continue. So I guess nobody will be leaving in the next 10 minutes. Because <laughs> if, if you understand what prashadam is, prashadam is something that's been offered to Krishna or offered to whatever deity you are offering to, but it becomes prashad, it becomes sanctified. And there are different tastes in prashadam, but prashadam, even if it doesn't taste good, it's still good. Prashadam is always good, even if it doesn't taste good. I like pizza, by the way. <laughs> Many people get confused about the Hare Krishna movement being sung almost as Hinduism. How do we explain this to them? You know the word Hinduism. You can explain that Hinduism is yeah. Actually, uh, Hinduism is not a word in any of our languages. We are Sanatana. Sanatana. I mean Gandhi, when you are asked what is your religion, he always said, I am a Sanatana Dharma. So Hindu term came because Sindhu is the river and to the east of that is this entire land. And Sindhu somehow at that time people pronounce this Hindu. And that's why Indus Valley civilizes. Arafa, Mahindra, okay, and uh, and from and then through uh, Upper Brahma, this became Hindu, okay. So so when people even politically they say Hindu, that means all those who inhabit in this part of land is Hindu. So in that sense, Hindu is not really a reason. Hindu are the native of the people who are living in the eastern part of. Sindhu River. Okay, that means all of Pakistan, the, the current <coughs> India, Pakistan, this is this whole thing is known as Hindustan and Hindi. Okay, so. so that's but unfortunately, I mean. the word Hindu is misinterpreted <coughs> by everybody as a as a religion. So you know, we say here in India, are you Hindu or are you Muslim? Hmm. But there is really is no Hindu. Yeah. It's like the Prabhu said, it comes from the word Sindhu, somehow or another it's being pronounced Hindu. But it really is not a religion. So and, and like we said, it's not in any of our literature. Unless Prabhupada actually would say in the purport about that exact statement. He would explain that. But unfortunately the whole world thinks that India is filled with him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 How was your transition period from hippie to devotee? Normally it is very pathetic to, yeah. break, uh, to bear withdrawal symptoms of leaving cigarettes and alcohol. Well, this is explained quite easily. Whose question was this? <laughs> okay. You guys got good questions up here, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> good. What do you experience? My own experience. So, my personal transition was, is that I was actually getting those things up anyway. And prior to meeting the devotees, I had kind of given them up. I had decided, hey, this is getting me nowhere. This, this alcohol drinking, this you know, smoking weed. I never smoked cigarettes, but I, I, I understood myself 
So giving it up wasn't so difficult. I was like, okay. And, and in Krishna consciousness, you get such a higher taste. It's so much more enjoyment that I would remember when I drank alcohol, I used to get a headache. I kind of forget what I did. But I was, you know, always, you know, having so much fun. But as a devotee, I was having more fun. And when you're having more fun, it's really easy to give up the less fun. And there are so many side effects to all those different things that it's not that hard to give up. So with the higher taste, you can give up a lower taste. Without the higher taste, then it becomes, like you said in the question, it's very difficult just to say, okay, I'm going to give up cigarettes. But what are you replacing it with? You have to replace those, those things with something else. And Krishna consciousness gives you those something else's and <coughs> helps you forget the lower taste in life. Okay? Oh, this question. I just had this in Bible talk about this in my book. Is everything that we get because of it's written in our destiny or by the choices that we make in life? Okay. I heard a very nice example of destiny. When you decide to fly to Calcutta, you book a ticket, you get on the plane, and it will take you to Calcutta. That is your destiny. While you are on the plane, you can look out the window, you can eat, you can read a magazine. That's your choice. That's the difference. Does that make sense? No. Done. You want to try? <laughs> the destiny is that you will get on the plane. It will take you to your destination. But while you are heading to that destination, you have to make so many different choices. So your destination is there. You are heading where? Back to Godhead. Eventually, yes. Your choice will help you get there quicker easier, but if you make the wrong choices, then that destiny will take a lot, lot longer. Okay? So your destiny is always to go back to God. That's where we're heading. But your choice will determine how quickly you can get there. Whose question is this? <coughs> can you raise your hand? Oh, good question. Ria. 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 Yeah, the, uh, so actually, uh, this is a good, uh, good question. So I, I could today. Yes. So you see, our destiny is already made based on what all we have done. You have got a human body. That's your destiny. You are born in a particular family. It's because of this. You didn't select it, is it? Did you select your father and mother? You didn't select it. Given a choice, you have selected probably Ambani or Bill Gates <laughs> your father. You are, you are not given a choice. So by destiny, you get your father mother. By destiny, you get your education. By destiny, you get your uh, wealth. Okay, this is what, what I do. And what is your current action that adds to further course of the destiny? Now you are a human being. Your current activity can make you go up, as Prabhupada is telling that you can go back to Godhead, or your current activities can even take you to lower species of life, like animals. In particularly in India, many people are befooled by many so-called pseudo spiritualists saying that once you are a human body, you will never uh, degrade to animal life. No. This is not accepted in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, those who are in mode of goodness, they go up. Those who are in mode of passion, they stay here. And those who are in mode of ignorance, they go to the lower species. So that's a very clear cut answer in Bhagavad Gita. So your current actions would add to the process of your destiny. But, you know, like, like Prabhupada said, now you are in a Tito. Sometimes you first go to uh, land in London and New York and then, like that. So whatever actions you have done, all those lights are already created for you. But 
your current action can make you free from those so called destiny and you can become a free person is that clear Again, there are so many philosophies available around to us today, so many versions of Bhagavad Gita. How to know which philosophy is bona fide? Well, the Bhagavad Gita question is very interesting. Because I think I mentioned tonight that prior to Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, there were several versions available in America. And anybody could read. And people in universities and educated people were reading Bhagavad Gita. But prior to Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as it is, there was not one Krishna devotee made from reading Bhagavad Gita. Because they were all interpreted with some point of view by somebody who felt that they had that right to interpret, to give their opinion of who Krishna is and what the lessons of Bhagavad Gita were. Prabhupada translated and gave purport. He called his Bhagavad Gita as it is. There's no I think, I feel, none of that. Prabhupada simply translated it. And the whole idea is of this Bhagavad Gita is to understand that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He is the one that's in Bhagavad Gita. He is the main character of Bhagavad Gita. And if you can understand that, then you've understood the real purpose of Bhakti Gita. Yeah. How to know which philosophy is bona fide? Well, I like an American expression. The proof is in the pudding. Have you ever heard that? The proof is in the pudding. You taste it. You taste that philosophy. Does it work for you? I tasted this Krishna consciousness and it worked for me. But I always say, if somebody has something better, let me know. I'll do it. If it's better, I'll do it. But as far as I have seen in my 45 years of being a Hare Krishna, there's nothing better than being a Hare Krishna and following this philosophy. It's pretty simple. I think that's it. Yeah. Any other question? <coughs> you talked about the sadhus. Who is the sadhu? But obviously in Concord there's not too many sadhus. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there's not a whole lot of sadhus, but a sadhu is a wise man. One who understands the purpose of life, who understands who God is. That is a sadhu. And by calling us Western sadhus, Prabhupada is simply making the point that anybody, anybody can understand God. It's not by birth. It's not by any qualifications. It's not by any degrees. It's simply the surrender process. And all Prabhupada's disciples, they surrendered. What Prabhupada was giving them, Bhagavad Gita as it is, they surrendered to it. So Prabhupada was sort of having a play on words, saying, my Western sadhus. I mean, obviously we're not sadhus, but we are followers of this Sanatana Dharma. And it does bring about the best of everything in you, because you understand how to act, how you should be, and what the goal of life is. So I guess in one way we are sadhu. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he is very humble not to say that I am not a sadhu, but he is actually a sadhu. And we are very blessed to have a sadhu with us. <laughs> <laughs> I like the dancing white elephant. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. One more? Two more. How to balance time for job and studies and services. Okay. Who asked that one? If I haven't spoken to you about this yet, okay. I've been asked this question probably 10 times in the last two days. How to balance this? It is so difficult for you. I get it. But you're a student, right? You're here for a reason. You have to study. You have to make that a priority. You're also trying to be Krishna conscious. 
You have to make that a priority. And you have to do some service. Because Krishna says, you will know me through devotional service only. So you have to make that a priority. <laughs> <laughs> now what? But you have to understand, at this particular stage in your life, you cannot diminish your studies. That's very, very important. And you must do as much service that time allows and chant as much japa as time allows with the rest of your time. But your studying is very, very important. It's not, you won't be studying for the rest of your life. But the japa and the service, hopefully, you will be doing for the rest of your life. So finding that balance is kind of a personal thing. You know what time is allotted to what and what you can. And you can also look at your day and say, well, I, you know, I sat and I just talked nonsense. We talked about cricket. We talked about the latest movies. And there is time there that you've wasted that you could have been doing service or job of if that was your choice. So it, it, it's a personal thing, okay? So you have to decide. You have to look at your day. You have to look at your time allotment. And that, for anybody that wants to be successful, they have to do that. So hopefully you're doing that. Okay. Well, I get asked the same question again. How to stay enthusiastic in devotional service despite, what's that word? Reverses. Reverses of life in <coughs> practice. How to stay enthusiastic. Okay. When you wake up in the morning, are you enthusiastic? Anybody here wake up like super fired up every day? <laughs> no, nobody does, right? But it's a slow process. You get up, okay, you have a shower, water, you wake up. Next thing you know, you're doing something and the enthusiasm starts to happen. Well, basically, that's what we're doing. On our path back to Godhead, we're doing that. We're getting splashed with some cold water. We're in the speed bump. We walk into the wall. We're not quite awake. But we keep going. We don't stop. Now, if your goal is to go back to Godhead, now, that should be everyone's goal, to get back to Godhead, because that's really what we want to do. We don't want to stay here. So if I tell you, you want, say you want to go to Calcutta, and I'm going to give you a ticket to Calcutta, and I'm going to tell you the flight's at 2 o'clock. At 1.55, you're still at home going, <laughs> you're going to miss that flight. But if I say, look, you've got a ticket, it's at 2 o'clock, you're going to go, all right, woo, I'm going to go, I'm going to go get this ticket, I'm going to go fly, I'm going to be, why all of a sudden you're enthusiastic? Because you're going to get that goal that you wanted, you're going to get to Calcutta. So think of it that way. You're going back to Godhead. Are you going to be enthusiastic about that? Or are you just going to go, oh, man, you know, if I go, I know. <laughs> no, you're going to be like, yeah, what do I need to do? Where's my bag? I'm ready to go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. All of a sudden, that enthusiasm comes. Where did it come from? Because you're starting to sense there's a reason why I want to do this, I want this, I'm going to get excited to get it. And that's how you should be. You're going to go back to Godhead. Follow this process. Go back to Godhead. Who's with me? Let's go! Right? So you want that enthusiasm because it's a, it's a tangible goal to go back to Godhead. Prabhupada has given us a process to go back to Godhead. Doesn't that make you enthusiastic? Testimony. <laughs> it's all. Okay, I think that's it. <laughs> Yeah. Any other question? Going once, going twice. So maybe uh, as I, as we conclude, 
you can probably narrate one of the you know you have many experience uh -huh. uh, as you preach or you talk you know you travel some of the vicinity one of the vicinity experience that you have sure you can, sure <laughs> okay <laughs> I just like this story because I like it, but I, I go to Bangladesh to preach twice a year. And Bangladesh is a very, very wonderful place. I absolutely love going there. So I'll tell you a story. The first time I went to Bangladesh, I, it was on a Friday. And Friday is there often, and I didn't know that. So they actually pull into the temple. I'm in a, a, a tinted window van. And they open the door, and there's 500 people there going, hey, 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 hey. And I'm saying, whoa, what's going on here? I mean, I'm just me. I'm not like anybody celebrity. And they're bringing me garlands, and I'm like, wow, this is so cool. I really love this. This is kind of fun. I'm really getting into it. Well, Bangladesh is such a special place. I was speaking on stage, and I'm doing my thing on stage. You know, people are laughing, and they're you know, having a good time. And I'm, doing, I'm feeling this connection with everybody there. And I said a statement that I might regret. I said, I'm feeling so much love with everybody in this room. And I just feel like hugging every single one of you. And then I finished my talk. And I walked off stage, and 250 people came and hugged me. <laughs> <laughs> All at once, 250, I was like, no, oh, it's going to work. I'm just starting to think, oh, no, I didn't really mean it. But I had like this giant hug. 250 people, all at once, were hugging me. It was like one of the most amazing things. So you have to be very careful when you say things. <laughs> Okay, I think that we will compare, conclude this session with the last question. Oh, going to be a good one. Can you give some problems we face in old age? <laughs> <laughs> All right, look at that. How would I know? <laughs> no. so, who wrote this? Oh, come on. <laughs> Can you give me some problems we face in old age, but as we are young, cannot understand and comprehend? That's actually a good question. Because when I was young, I didn't get it either. I totally did not get it. And you want some problem? You get old, big deal. But old age really, really is an impediment. In one way. And in another way, it's actually a bone, a real boon. A real boon because you just can't do some of the nonsense things you want to do and it just I can't do it why am I even bothered about it but it's actually very difficult because no matter what old age brings pain and it brings some suffering that you don't get as a young man <coughs> staying I'm taking for shot on the food. He's bringing me this wonderful, wonderful, different courses, so many different things, and I'm like, I can't eat that. I can't, I can't eat that. I can't eat this. My stomach's saying, you can't eat any of this stuff. It's got your spices. Your stomach doesn't handle spices. When I was a young man, I'd be like, ah! This <laughs> will be all down. Now I'm an old body. i got to be careful what I eat. We have cure time. We're in Prabhu's house. Everyone's jumping up and down. I go like this and I fade to the back. <laughs> That's old age. So it, it is a It's hard. It's hard when you get older. But it also has its benefits. I must be honest. It does have its benefits. I'm starting to see life a lot different. Because you know what it's like when you're in a race, and the race starts out, and you're in the middle of the race, and this is going to go forever, and I can't do this. But when you get to the end of the race, you can see the finish line. It's like, whoa, okay, I'm getting close now. I can see the finish line. I'm going to give it everything I got. And that's how I'm feeling right now. I'm seeing the finish line. It's not that far away from me. I'm just having my god brothers and god sisters. Almost every week, I'm hearing somebody left their body, this one left their body, so I know it's coming close. 
So with that in mind, I'm hitting that finish line as hard as I can. So it is a boon and it's also a pain in the neck. But enjoy young, your youth. Well, how old are you? <laughs> how? 29. 29. You're almost 30. That's almost a little bit old, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> So, so now we are ready for Prashadam, but before that, let us give a big hand to Prabhu. Hope to see you many more times, and uh, uh, and hope to see that uh, all of you again coming and interacting with you.